We read about the universe, how huge it is, how long it's been going, 14 plus billion years. Stars that have been in existence for hundreds of millions of years makes you feel very small. But then the Buddha says, we've been around longer than they have. This is just one universe. We've been through many cycles of many universes, to the point where he says, you can't trace back and find the point where ignorance began and got the whole process started. And he was someone whose mind was not blown away by the size of the universe and the amount of time that's passed. But what he saw was that this constant craving we have that keeps us going, it's potentially endless. And what does it create? It creates lots of things that then come crashing down, even in just one lifetime. There are a lot of things you do, a lot of things that you're attached to, and they just slip from your fingers. I know a lot of people have been commenting on how living in the pandemic, living in constrained circumstances, you start thinking about the past a lot, the things you miss from the past, the things you regret having done in the past. But it's good to put that all into perspective. Because casting back to the past can often hurt. You think about the dumb things you did, the heartless things you did, the unthinking things you did. That's one source of pain. And then all the things that were really nice about the past, but they're gone. There's no way of getting them back. Well, that's just one lifetime. How many lifetimes have you been through? Well, it's been the same story again and again and again. I know one monk who one night had a whole series of memories. He said ten past lifetimes in one night, and that was just ten. He said each time it ended, each life ended. One thing that came to his mind was all that suffering, all that suffering. And he would keep going for it. Think about King Gorabya. Here he is, 80 years old. He means to put his foot in one place and it goes someplace else. He's got this recurrent illness. He's stashed away all kinds of treasures that he knows that he's not going to be able to take with him. And yet when he's offered the opportunity of conquering another kingdom and getting more treasure, he'll go for it, even if it's on the other side of the ocean. That's what craving does. And as the Buddha said, we're a slave to craving. And this is our payment. We're going blind into the future. Kurt Vonnegut and a couple of his novels talks about a force he calls the universal will to become. He says the extraterrestrials have learned how to harness this and can send their spaceships around. But it says blind going forward, going forward, going forward, but not knowing where you're going. You get some vague idea and you run for it. And then you turn around and look what you've actually accomplished. And it just disappears, leaves some pain, then you go for it again. So this is what we have to tame. If we want to find any real happiness, we've got to get this under control, this craving. The Buddha says there are three kinds. The big one is sensual craving. 
That's why when a monk ordains, first thing that he gets taught after being taught the Triple Gem, the five subjects of meditation, contemplating the body, the parts of the body you can see, hair of the head, hair of the, the body, nails, teeth, skin. These are the parts of the body you can see. These are the ones that we go for and they're attractive. But if you took these parts off, to say nothing of what was left, just take those parts off and put them in a pile on the floor. There's nothing that you would really go for. And yet we want another body. We want another body. We keep going for it. When will we learn? The craving to become. You've tried this. Next time around you may try something else, and then try something else. Different identities, different worlds of experience. That's one of the Buddha's discoveries, that there are many, many worlds of experience. But what they all have in common is that they're fabricated. You will not experience them unless you are fabricating them. I was asked a question a while back. How can we say that everything is unsatisfactory if we haven't tried everything? Well, for one, we don't say unsatisfactory. And the Buddha didn't say just everything is unsatisfactory. He said all fabricated things are inconstant, all fabricated things are stressful, not worth calling you or yours. They're not self. And how do we know that? They're not worth claiming, because they come out of the mind. You can see the process as it happens in the mind. The Buddha calls craving the, the guide to becoming. also calls it the seamstress, is what stitches things together. Say this together with that, and that together with this, that would be kind of nice. That's what it thinks. And then it goes for it, and then it decides it doesn't like where it is, and then has the craving for non-becoming. But in the craving for non-becoming, you end up creating more becomings. That was one of the Buddha's insights. The craving to destroy what you've got. That leads to more becoming. So you want to see how these things get stitched together. And the reason we look for that is because the Buddha said when you learn how to stop doing it, you find that there's something unfabricated. It's always been there. But you're too interested in what you can fabricate. What you pass judgment on is not things out there. But you look at the process of fabrication, as I said. You wouldn't experience the worlds of becoming unless there was this fabrication in the mind. And you look at the process of fabrication, and it's very inconstant. You go for this, then you go for that, then you go for the other thing. Even when you get focused in concentration and try to fabricate just one thing continually, you have to fight to begin with. It's doable, and it's part of the path out. But it is part of the path, it's not the goal, because you realize that this too has to be constantly fabricated. And you begin to wonder, is there something that doesn't require fabrication at all? The Buddha says there is. The noble disciples said the Buddha was right. So look at your cravings. How much can you trust them? Now the craving to get out, the Buddha says, trust that one. But it has to be trained, because like all other cravings, it's, it starts out blind. This is why right view is the first part of the path. It's not right knowledge yet, knowledge in terms of the Four Noble Truths, that finally cuts through the craving doesn't come until the path has been fully developed. But right view as a beginning factor gives you some direction. So when your views are in line with right view, 
Okay, remind yourself, that's when you're beginning to see clearly. That's when you're beginning to point your cravings in the right direction. Any parts of the mind that go against right view, you've got to call them into question, because they're going to take you down blind paths. And the thing is, there are paths you've been down many times before. Some people say, well, let me try everything before I go to nirvana. I want to taste this, I want to taste that. What this level of being is, what that level of being is. You've been there. The problem is you keep forgetting. And one of the reasons you forget is because the moment of death that separates being in one world from another one is just so painful. So we have the Dharma, we have the example of the Buddha, an expert with regard to the cosmos, loka we do, we chant it every day, every day. They said, look, this is what the cosmos has to offer, all these wonderful things. The only way you're going to experience them is through this process of fabrication, and anything you're going to fab fabricate is going to be inconstant, and it's going to leave you. So you look for the one thing that will take you to something that's not fabricated. You fabricate the path, but it can deliver you to the unfabricated. That's your lifeline. That's our only hope to get out of here. Otherwise, you can think about those stories I have about the universe. Everything turns into black holes. Everything gets swallowed up, and then it starts all over again. So ask yourself whether you've had enough. And as long as the mind isn't fully trained, there will be part of the mind that keeps on saying, not yet, not yet. Just make sure you don't let that part of the mind get in charge. <laughs>